what we call neurogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, but also uh, uh, remind you that during this ischemia to the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary will be affected. So we get things like diabetes insipidus. Uh, uh, we get also uh, a situation of hypothermia and uh, eventually acidosis due to those number of hormonal and hemodynamic changes. But we'll focus later on on the pituitary and hypothalamic. Um, uh, but before that, of course, when you get hypotension, you are shifting the metabolism to anaerobic, uh, which means that the cell will be an, uh, under anaerobic uh, uh, respiration um, and metabolism and accumulation of lactate and so forth. There is some relationship between this and also the lack of certain hormones, especially thyroxine. So now let's go to the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Uh, we have a hypothalamus, and this is the area in the brain that control uh, the uh, uh, pituitary gland uh, through hormones that goes to the anterior pituitary. We call them releasing and, and, and uh, inhibiting hormones. And then through also uh, neurological or nerve uh, tissue to the posterior pituitary uh, from the hypothalamic area, which control uh, the thirst and the uh, secretion of um, AVP or vasopressin uh, from the posterior pituitary. So as you know, the pituitary itself is uh, two parts, uh, one that anterior, and this is what release all the hormones that control all other uh, 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 glands in the body. So we have ACTH that control the adrenal gland, we have TSH that control the thyroid, and we have FSH LH controlling the gonads and growth hormone. Uh, also, we have prolactin, of course. And then the posterior uh, pituitary is the one that actually store uh, vasopressin and oxytocin and release them. And this is what preserve free water. So this is the connection of the anterior pituitary, the hypothalamus, which is blood supply whereas the posterior pituitary connect to the hypothalamus with the nerve tissue. So all these areas will be affected whether the hypothalamus and the pituitary with uh, ischemic brain and brain death, and therefore diabetes insipidus is one of the main feature for liquidification or uh, uh, injury or ischemia to the uh, brain stem and the hypothalamus. And this is usually an ominous sign uh, in patients in the intensive care unit that uh, usually indicate brain death and skin. So what is the consequences? Because of uh, this pituitary hypothalamic uh, deficiency uh, that happened with brain ischemia, of course, major brain ischemia and brain death, uh, there's a decrease eventually of thyroid hormone. There's a decrease of ACTH and that will cause decreased cortisol. There is, uh, as we mentioned, uh, some uh, excessive insulin resistance, uh, excessive catecholamines and, and kind of fighting hormones that will create uh, increased insulin resistance. Uh, and that will cause hyperglycemia. Of course, decreased cortisol can cause also collapse, circulatory collapse, but also decrease in the uh, organism ability to fight inflammation or to fight infection. Uh, so there is decreased inflammatory response and the decrease in thyroid hormone is connected to circulatory collapse, although it has actually function all over the organism, including respiration or cellular respiration. But the immediate effect is uh, kind of uh, 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 decrease in the vascular tone. And, and of course, if the posterior pituitary is affected, as we mentioned, diabetes sensitivity will result. So uh, in addition, hypothermia can, can be the cause of injury or ischemia to the, uh, or failure to the hypothalamus, because this is where the temperature is preserved or the thermostat of the body is preserved. So of course, the natural question, the natural 
response that we might have in our mind that if this is the case, if we have this disturbance in the uh, hormones due to this uh, brain ischemia or brain death, then it would make just uh, a sense that if we replace those hormones, meaning the thyroxine, the cortisol, the, uh, dismo, the uh, vasopressin, uh, that probably we can uh, get the uh, organism situation of the uh, uh, brain dead uh, donor uh, to be in a better situation and decrease the circulatory collapse and therefore improve the outcome of transplant. This is theoretical, but we have to prove it. Indeed, people did this, did the studies. Uh, not all these studies are, are perfect. Uh, some of them were just case control. Some of them were uh, retrospective and some were prospective studies. And so they have, we have a little bit of uh, different type of results from each of these type of studies. But in general, the studies have shown that if we use T4 or T3, uh, we will improve the tissue and organ perfusion uh, and therefore decrease this anaerobic uh, metabolism or respiration of the cellular river to aerobic. As I, as, as I told you before, thyroxine is involved in this process. And not only that we will improve this, un, uh, this situation, the anaerobic metabolism and improve it to aerobic, decreasing lactate. But also there are some studies showing T4 and T3 increasing blood pressure, so decreasing the vasculator, vas vascular collapse and increasing the left ventricular function and decreasing ionotrope requirement uh, of those uh, donors. This is one of those studies where they compare 26 uh, uh, donors uh, with conventional treatment, meaning not giving hormone, just giving vasopressor and, and fluid with another 21 donors that received uh, hormonal replacement, not just with uh, uh, T3, but with cortisol and insulin. Insulin, of course, because of the hyperglycemia and cortisol to compensate for the cortisol deficiency. So uh, in the conventional arm, there was, there was progressive hemodynamic deterioration, worsening of acidosis, and uh, less procurement of, uh, procurement of the, uh, less procurement of the organs. Uh, however, with the uh, uh, hormonal arm, uh, all these, all these uh, parameters improve. Now, Another protocol would be using T4. Uh, some will use T3. And the T4, what we call the T4 protocol, uh, consists of uh, giving thyroxine at 20 microgram IV. Uh, uh, and to start after that as a bolus, and then start a drip with, uh, of T4 at uh, a level of 40 microgram per hour. Also to give a dose of insulin. Uh, there's hyperglycemia and a, a kind of a high dose solimedrol. Um, uh, those patients even receive dextrose with the insulin. So this was their prot protocol with very close monitoring of potassium and CDP. And in this uh, study, uh, they looked uh, with this protocol, they looked uh, prospectively this time with 19 uh, hemodynamically unstable donors. This study actually chose 19 hemodynamically unstable donors and went ahead and give them those replacement or what we call the T4 protocol. Uh, and they looked on what happened after. So this is uh, not a controlled study, but it's a self-control where patients before the treatment were looked at, their uh, vasopressor requirement, their cardiac index, their oxygen consumption, et cetera. And uh, then after the protocol, those parameters were looked at. And as you see here with the p-value, that is significant. There was less vasopressor use. There was a better heart rate, slow, slowing in the heart rate. And then another parameters that improved was the oxygen consumption. There were better oxygen consumption, which means more aerobic than anaerobic respiration or metabolism. Uh, also, 
the extraction of oxygen improved, went up. Uh, so the, there were some parameters that improved and they uh, looked here in the uh, vasopressor dose in those patients after administering the uh, T4 protocol and there was significant decrease in vasopressor. But again, this is not a controlled, a placebo controlled. It's not a double blind, but it's uh, again, a group of patients where they use, they were uh, served as a self control. Now, uh, not only this, but uh, when they looked in the uh, amount of organ that they, they were uh, uh, able to, to save in those donors, in the two groups, the hormonal groups and the non-hormonal groups, uh, there were better number of organs, 4.2 versus 3.8 and 3.1 versus 2.5, uh, whether you're talking about younger or even older. So in the two groups of patients less than 40 and more than 40, uh, both had better results with the hormonal replacement. Now, this is just kind of analysis of what we said. However, all these uh, non-randomized studies, uh, they all almost unanimously showed improvement with the use of thyroid hormone and other hormone replacement. However, there are other studies, uh, and in this analysis, there were seven of them that were randomized control, uh, that they concluded there was no clinical benefit of thyroid hormone therapy. So there is no uh, a kind of universal agreement that thyroid hormone will make a difference. So there was a meta-analysis that, that took all those randomized control studies and actually in this meta-analysis, they did not show improvement in the cardiac index or the vasoactive drug requirements uh, in those who used thyroid hormone. And you see here, the meta-analysis in is zero, meaning there was no benefit uh, or, or uh, of course, any harm, but there was no, uh, no, nothing to favor this arm versus this arm. So how can we consolidate this together? How can we understand? And in this analysis, they noticed that the major limitation of case series study, that most of them showed benefit actually, was they did not look for uncontrolled variables. There were other variables that they did not look that might have affect the result and give us this positive result that may not be exactly due to the thyroxin. There were probably some, um, bias in, in, in choosing those patients as well. On the other hand, the randomized controlled trials, also they have their own problem because the number of patients were so small, especially those who were hemodynamically unstable, that a meaningful conclusion or, or benefit could not be reached in those type of studies. So if we really need to do a good study, we need a randomized control, but we need a large number to show whether this type of uh, intervention would be helpful one. So meanwhile, the uh, uh, Society for Critical Care has made a recommendation, uh, which we are probably following, and I'm sure you will follow, that thyroid hormone replacement is indicated in certain situations. Certainly, if there's hemodynamic instability, because there's some evidence that thyroid, thyroid replacement in those patients could stabilize those patients decrease their vasopressor. And of course, if there's a reduced ejection fraction, less than 45%, because there's some benefit also in improving ejection fraction. And uh, needless to say, those who have already known, the donors who have already known hypothyroidism should probably continue to receive thyroxine. What is the regimen? 20 microgram IV bolus of T4, followed by infusion of 10 mic per hour. There are other uh, 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 protocols, but this seems to be uh, for the one that is most popular. Now, let's move to another hormone, which is corticosteroid. So again, because of the damage uh, at the pituitary hypothalamus, the ACTH will drop and the ability of the adrenal gland to respond to stress will decrease. Uh, and the question again, whether if we give corticosteroid, if we give steroid in a large dose, uh, whether we can improve uh, the uh, donor um, function, organ function, and therefore 
improve the outcome of the transplantation and the procurement. So uh, we know for sure that uh, giving prednisone might have a theoretical benefit. We know that it reduces inflammation in organs. I think this is very well established. There are some evidence in some study that increase organ retrieval. We will look in this. Improved donor organ function and graft survival. Uh, we use steroid always post-transplant as example, uh, and maybe improves cardiac function following transplantation. So uh, this is a study that was done uh, in that regard, and it was a prospective study actually, 20 patients with a brain injury. And Although they have brain injury, they did not have brain death. So they call them group A, are one brain injury without brain death. And then we have 17 other patients called group B, where they have brain injury plus evidence of brain death. And they looked here physiologically on what is the difference between the A and B, meaning the brain death versus no brain death. And they found clearly that uh, cortisol level will go down, uh, average eight versus uh, 17, and average, uh, if you do stimulation, you will not be able to stimulate as much of those with the brain death versus the uh, one without brain death who stimulated that. I don't think that comes as a surprise at all, because of course we know that because of the hypothalamic adrenal, uh, pituitary adrenal axis, the response will be worse when there is brain death. But the real question whether if we give uh, those patients with brain, uh, who are brain dead donors, if we give them steroids, whether we can make any difference. So this is a prospective randomized control study of 100 brain dead donors. 50 of them did receive high dose methylprednisolone, 24. 250 milligram uh, by an infusion of 100 milligram per hour and until organ recovery. So they looked in parameters and sure enough, they have reduced uh, inflammatory markers like interleukin-2 and 6 and TNF, a tumor necrosis factor, significantly lower levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, it reduce inflammatory cytokines and adhesion. This is all good theoretical uh, an expected response to steroid, uh, decreased ischemia perfusion post-transplant, decreased acute uh, uh, rejection. Okay, now, did that help in the renal transplant and those renal transplant patients? So out of those 136 donors received methylprednisolone, uh, this time uh, in this study, uh, 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 1,000 milligram IV for three hours. Uh, again, they reduce inflammation on renal biopsy. Uh, and what about the uh, effect in acute uh, re rejection, meaning the worsening of creatinine over time? There was no difference between the groups that received uh, steroid and this, and the one that did not receive steroids. So systemic suppression of inflammation decreased Indeed, it was decreased in those donors that received steroid, but it did not reduce the incident of post-transplant acute renal failure, or meaning allo allograft rejection. So maybe there is some benefit, but it, it doesn't translate exactly to a better uh, uh, rejection or less rejection in the recipients. So what is the, again, the Society of Critical Care uh, Medicine uh, recommendation? They did recommend high dose corticosteroid to reduce the potential deleterious effect of the, of course, brain death. And the recommendation is to use uh, one gram of methylprednisone um, or 15 milligram per kilogram IV or 250 milligram IV bolus followed by infusion of 100 milligram per hour. So there are different protocols. Some will give a big uh, bolus uh, versus just uh, weight 
based bolus or a bolus, an S bolus uh, followed by nitrogen. Uh, what about uh, DDAVP or vasopressin? Uh, here, I think things are more clear. If you have evidence of diabetes sensitivities, there is no question that if you give uh, vasopressin that you can make a difference in terms of the uh, dehydration of the uh, donor or in terms of the hypernatremia or the uh, loss of free water. So I think that here there may be clear indication to give if there is evidence, of course, of the eye, whether this is came as a hypernatremia or volume depletion, et cetera. So the uh, indication clearly here is high potential despite adequate volume resuscitation, especially if there is evidence of hypernatremia uh, or a clear uh, DI, even if there is no hemodynamic instability, the patient clearly showing hypernatremia and polyuria. Uh, um, that's not stopped by or corrected just by the fluid. And the doses, uh, normally we use anywhere between one to two microgram IV uh, once output increases. Uh, so it is, initially you can give a one to four microgram as a bolus, and then you can give one to two microgram uh, as needed. Uh, if you're using dismopressin, normally you don't need to give a dose more than every eight hours because the, uh, the medication has a good half-life. So putting all this together, what is the current guideline uh, in the use of hormone, standard hormone resuscitation in uh, those donors? Uh, the standard at this point is methylprednisolone, either a bolus of 50 milligram per kilogram bolus. Uh, T4, 20 microgram bolus, followed by 10 microgram per hour. If you have T3, and I know many places does not have T3 intravenously, so maybe not be easy to apply, but if you have T3, T3 is more potent, it's half-life, but use a less dose by four microgram bolus and three microgram per hour. And uh, vasopressin or DDAVP as needed, if there is evidence of DI uh, in a doses that can range between half to four units per hour. In addition, people might give dextrose plus insulin uh, to control blood glucose and keep it in a normal range. So again, this is a, a kind of summary that the indication for thyroxine uh, in those patients would be a previous history of hypothyroidism um, and also evidence of, of uh, vascular prolapse or hypotension, uh, especially if there is a low T4. And we mentioned the dose, 20 microgram followed by uh, infusion of 10 mic per hour. Vasopressin, if there is uh, again an impending brain death with Evidence of diabetes insipidus, hypotension like polyuria, very high urine output. Uh, normally we say more than 300 ml per hour uh, and increase in serum sodium and serum osmolality. Insulin indicated if there's brain death with hyperglycemia and prednisolone uh, will be indicated, especially if there's hypotension uh, at a dose of 15 milligram per kilogram. In summary then, uh, I think we, uh, I showed you that pathophysiology of brain injury does include insult to the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Uh, in addition to the uh, effect on the uh, force autonomic uh, system, the sympathetic system that initially would have a surge of catecholamine we call it storm, followed by uh, collapse. The use of thyroid hormone in brain dead organ donors who remain hemodynamically unstable despite vasopressive support is indicated. Consider earlier use of T4 in those who had severely brain injured patients because they might have worse uh, impact. This might have worse impact on their hypothalamic pituitary 
uh, access. Uh, T4 protocol reduces the need for vasopressor, improves the number of organ transplant. Uh, per the evidence we have so far, uh, other hormone replacement is also recommended as we discussed and according to the guideline. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for being on time. There's a few questions if you allow me, that, but uh, first one announcement, uh, please for the audience, we received more than a thousand messages. Uh, please stop putting your name and uh, your Saudi council on the chat because this is not a place we are not gonna collect it from here. When you did the registration, your number was there and we'll collect this. So please stop sending those chat questions. For the people who are not able to connect to us yesterday, basically because we reached the maximum number of registration. So uh, just please focus on because this is distracting the audience and also the speaker. So for uh, try to avoid putting all this uh, question. Now let's uh, focus on Dr. Hussain uh, uh, there is a question, is hormonal therapy useful for the recovery and preservation of the donor heart? I'm sorry, what therapy? I, I didn't hear you. Is that, the question is, is hormonal therapy useful for the recovery and preservation of the donor's heart? I don't know how... Uh, yeah, so uh, I can answer in general that at least in the study of the thyroxine replacement, uh, there was better uh, procurement of organs, including the heart, um, in those who received hormone therapy. But that protocol included, in addition to thyroxine, included also uh, steroid and included insulin and glucose. So it, it's hard to dissect which one was more helpful because they usually use the, the hormone replacement as a package. But there's more evidence for thyroxine, I guess, than for steroid, unless there is, of course, a clear indication for uh, use of steroid, like uh, somebody who has hypotension not responding to vasopressors. Uh, so I think the whole evidence does point to a better outcome of the organ. Whether it's a better outcome for the Recipient, I don't think we have that evidence. Uh, we do have evidence that for the kidney, as example, there is less inflammation in the kidney transplanted if uh, if those the donor receives steroid. But we don't have any evidence that the kidney um, had less rejection because the acute renal failure was similar in the two groups. I I haven't seen anything for the heart itself. Uh, but uh, there may be some, some reports that I'm not aware of. The other question is, what are the potential side effects of T4 use on heart and lung in donor organ transplant patient on ECMO? I'm not aware if there's any specific uh, things for that. Yeah. So yeah, we always uh, blame thyroxine. <laughs> um, that it increased heart rate, it might increase, of course, it increases uh, uh, the cardiac output. Uh, so this is actually uh, where they put the limitation for the use uh, and or the better indication for the use of thyroxine for those who have lower ejection fraction because it might improve the ejection fraction for the uh, donor uh, and therefore it improves the organ uh, situation. Uh, and also when there is a vaso uh, uh, respiratory collapse. But, you know, I, I believe the, all the studies are interested in improving the function of the organs that taken from the donors and not too uh, specific about side effect on the brain dead donor, uh, if there's any side effect of the brain dead donor. Um, so there may be some potential adverse effect, but what we have seen so far that actually thyroxine replacement and the cocktail, the hormonal cocktail, will end with less vasopressor, uh, 
a better ejection fraction and maybe better performance of organs. Thank you so much for saying that. So, uh, so we don't want to delay the next lecture. I really appreciate it. As usual, it's always a pleasure and a lot of uh, knowledge we can uh, benefit from your lecture and have a good day. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank so you much. for the good questions. Also. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Zainab al Dr. Zainab, she's a, a critical care consultant at King Faisal Hospital. Uh, Dr. Zainab, uh, it's always a pleasure to work with her uh, because, and learn from her because of her uh, knowledge, her uh, patient care. And she's going to talk about the organ dysfunction in the brain death. Uh, with no first day, Dr. Zainab, uh, I think if you can share your uh, slide. Okay, the microphone is you. You're muted if you can just open it. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. It's an honor and privilege uh, to be here today. Special thanks goes to uh, Dr. Jamil for his kind invitation. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking about organ dysfunction in the potential brain dead uh, organ donor. So uh, usually a catastrophic uh, brain uh, event precedes the diagnosis of brain death and multiple sequence of events occur uh, before uh, brain death uh, ensues. Uh, sorry, I cannot advance the slide for some reason. Yes, okay. So as I said, usually a catastrophic uh, brain event precedes the diagnosis of brain death and multiple sequence of events occurs uh, before the brain death uh, ensues. As the ICP starts to increase and the ischemic threshold of the brain is surpassed, the ischemia starts to progress from the rostral to the caudal areas of the brain. The ischemia usually starts from the medulla oblongata uh, compression, and as a result, and, um, an intense and large amount of catecholamine gets uh, secreted as a last resort to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure in the face of the uh, rising ICP what is called the autonomic storm, as Dr. Raif also explained, resulting in severe hypertension and bradycardia due to a baroreceptor stimulation. As the ischemia uh, progresses to involve the spinal cord, it also results in sympathetic deactivation and loss of the vasodilatory tone, resulting in further bradycardia and hypotension, eventually leading to um, herniation. There are uh, several physiological mechanisms that uh, leads to, um, that happens during brain death. First of all is the autonomic sympathetic storm that manifests as pushing triad uh, in terms of hypertension, bradycardia, and also agonal and abnormal respiration in a spontaneously breathing patients. This results from the catecholamine surge leading to increase in systemic vascular resistance, very severe hypertension, and all of this direct effect can also lead to stunned myocardium, arrhythmia, and neurogenic pulmonary edema. And in the next slides, we will go through all of these in details. As this progresses, there is also loss of sympathetic tone due to compression of the spinal cord, leading to hypotension due to vasodilatation, and hypothermia due to vasodilatation and um, heat loss. There is also disruption of the pituitary axis with derangement of the thyroid hormone, a deficiency of vasopressin and cortisol and insulin resistance as explained earlier. All of this leads to uh, anaerobic metabolism shift and also endothelial dysfunction leading to uh, an inflammatory state with severe cytokine release and inflammatory mediator release. The, uh, there are potential uh, multiple injuries that could happen to the potential transplantable organ. It can happen before brain death, during the process of brain death, and after brain death happens. 
the, it can happen before brain death when uh, the initial catastrophe or the initial injury happens, such as uh, the uh, injury from body trauma, resulting in tissue damage, hemorrhage, hypotension, and aspiration, as well as uh, several iatrogenic uh, causes, uh, such as injurious settings from mechanical ventilation, hospital acquired infection, and adverse drug reactions. During brain death process, uh, the uh, potential organ also is subjected to further injury that happens during the autonomic storm induced by the catecholamine surge. As there is um, severe hypertension, this causes sheer stresses on the endothelial walls, leading to endothelial uh, vessel dysfunction and also peripheral vasoconstriction and hypoperfusion and ischemia to the tissue, uh, and also the loss of the hypothalamic regulation. After brain death happens and uh, the uh, autonomic storm or the sympathetic storm resolved, then uh, the potential organ could also have further injuries caused by the hemodynamic collapse due to lack of sympathetic system activation, leading to hypotension and bradycardia, further worsening the uh, hypoperfusion to the organs, as well as the uh, metabolic and hormonal derangement that could impact on the uh, metabolism, shifting the uh, aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism, lactic acidosis, as well as the iatrogenic uh, also uh, causes that could happen during the uh, ICU stay. The transplanted organ uh, could also have further injury during the cold ischemia time after the procurement and also after being transplanted with reperfusion injury once the perfusion to this uh, transplanted organ is restored. Uh, so the brain death could have multi-system uh, dysfunction affecting the cardiovascular respiratory ending with the kidneys, causing uh, renal impairment, hematological derangement, as well as endocrine derangement. The incidence of these uh, complication varies uh, in uh, brain dead uh, donors. Uh, the uh, First of all, the hypothermia, it uh, happens invariably in all patients, especially if not uh, prevented, that could be caused by the hypothalamic damage, reducing the metabolic uh, rate, as well as the lack of sympathetic stimulation and vasodilation leading to heat loss. Uh, second, it, hypotension uh, that could be caused by severe vasoplegia, hypovolemia, whether absolute or relative, and also uh, myocardial dysfunction and severe coronary uh, blood vessel uh, vasoconstriction caused by the autonomic storm that happens in uh, most of patients up to 97%. DI uh, also could happen due to posterior pituitary damage in up to 50%, and uh, as well as arrhythmias. Uh, hematological derangement such as DIC and coagulopathy could also happen in up to 50% of patients due to uh, the endothelial injury leading to uh, activation of the inflammatory cascade, release of the necrotic brain uh, tissue into the systemic circulation leading to coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia. Uh, lastly, pulmonary edema can happen up to uh, 20% of patients, and we are going to go through the mechanism in the next few slides. This is another uh, study that's uh, taking 69 patients, again showing the incidence of this complication. As we mentioned, in most of patients, they do have a hypotension requiring vasopressor support, followed by around 50% of patients, they would have coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, and diabetes insipidus. Around one third of patients will have cardiac ischemia, lactic acidosis, renal failure, and ARDS. Coming to uh, the first system, the uh, cardiac uh, dysfunction, as we mentioned before, uh, when the Cushing triad happens due to the catecholamine surge, it can lead to a very intense vasoconstriction. 
and tachycardia. This severe hypotension will lead to a central redistribution of the blood volume into the right side of the heart, will cause severe pulmonary vasoconstriction, will increase the afterload for the left ventricle, and all of this will lead to stunning of the myocardium, development also of a neurogenic pulmonary edema, and the stunned myocardium might also have uh, develop also cardiac arrhythmia. The myocardial injury usually happens in around one third of patients. In around 40% of uh, patients, there is echocardiographic evidence of myocardial dysfunction. Usually it is caused during the uh, autonomic storm that causes subendothelial ischemia, focal myocardial necrosis and endothelial injury due to uh, the direct effect of the catecholamines and also due to decrease the coronary blood flow. This slide, it illustrates the, uh, as the autonomic starts uh, where the, there is a leak of intense and large amount of catecholamine, the blood pressure could really reach to a very dangerous level in 200s and more. And with that, the uh, afterload uh, over the left ventricle will increase. The pulmonary vessel will have severe vasoconstriction, leading to increase the left atrial wedge pressure, uh, resulting in a capillary leak and pulmonary edema. This is another study that shows the uh, incidence of cardiac dysfunction from the pediatric population. As you could see in the third column, a uh, brain death uh, patient could have a uh, low ejection fraction uh, around 40%, and they could also have uh, regional wall motion abnormalities as well. Uh, several also uh, ECG changes has been observed in the brain dead uh, donors, uh, such as J wave or the Osborne wave that happens similarly in hypothermic patients or in Brugada syndrome. Uh, prolonged QT interval, ST changes, whether depression or elevation in around almost uh, one third of patients. Uh, this is a series of images that shows uh, in the uh, A image, it shows a normal LV function where you can see a small LV cavity uh, before brain death uh, issues. As the brain death already happened, you start to see LV dysfunction in the uh, B image where you could see the LV is dilated and it's already uh, ballooned. And it causes also a Takotsubo-like uh, picture. So what are the uh, causes also of hypotension in the uh, potential organ donors uh, as well? There are several causes that can lead to hypotension. First of all, there could be a problem with the tank resulting in hypovolemia, whether absolute or relative. There could be a problem with the pump resulting in cardiac dysfunction or a problem with the pipes with vasodilation. For the hypovolemia, it could be an absolute hypovolemia that results from the initial injury because of bleeding, inadequate resuscitation with fluid or blood and third spacing, or because of high ICP measures that we institute to treat high ICP, such as mannitol resulting in dehydration, and also hyperglycemia because of insulin resistance or cold diuresis due to hypothermia and diabetes insipidus. There could be a relative uh, hypovolemia, which uh, is meant by increased capacitance of the vessels because of vasodilatation and loss of the vasomotor tone. Um, the, for the cardiac dysfunction, it could be pre-existing or it could happen during the initial insult from, uh, let's say, a polytrauma resulting in myocardial contusion, pericardial tamponade, or ischemia or it can happen during the brain death process from the catecholamine uh, surge, 
or the metabolic derangement that can cause myocardial depression, such as acidosis, hypothermia, and electrolyte disturbance, and endocrinopathy, such as hypothyroidism and low uh, T3 and T4, that can have deleterious effect on the cardiac function, as well as uh, also at the cellular level due to uh, metabolism uh, changes, uh, so, and also uh, as well arrhythmias. For the uh, vasodilatation, it can happen uh, due to several causes, such as the spinal shock, the lack of catecholamines after the resolution of the autonomic storm, and uh, loss of the autoregulation, uh, as well as because of uh, loss of the cortisol and adrenal insufficiency and endocrinopathy. And do not forget that sepsis also could happen afterwards in these patients. Cardiac arrhythmia has also been observed in almost uh, one third of these patients. They could have atrial tachycardia, ventricular arrhythmias. All of these uh, could happen during the autonomic storm. What about the respiratory dysfunction? Uh, again, it could happen during the initial insult where uh, the patient, let's say he had polytrauma, he aspirated, he had lung contusion. Uh, as a result, he also had uh, atelectasis or during his ICU course uh, due to iatrogenic causes, such as ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, dangerous uh, mechanical uh, ventilatory settings, pulmonary edema from massive resuscitation and fluid overload, and ARDS from the original insult or uh, that happens afterwards from an infection. And lastly, it could be related to the process of uh, brain death, uh, what we call neurogenic pulmonary edema. The neurogenic pulmonary edema, it happens usually, as we explained before, during the uh, catecholamine surge, uh, there will be an increase in the uh, blood pressure resulting in severe hypertension and increase the LV afterload, as well as increase the blood uh, diversion into the right ventricle, with severe uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction, uh, then what will happen, the left atrial pressures will exceed the right-sided pressures, stopping the pulmonary blood flow, resulting in capillary leak and pulmonary edema, and they could have as well also alveolar hemorrhage. There is also the other theory that is uh, for the neurog uh, neurogenic pulmonary edema called the BLAST theory. Uh, during the catecholamine surge, we activate the alpha receptor and the beta receptor. And the alpha receptor will uh, result in peripheral vasoconstriction, pulmonary uh, venous uh, constriction, leading to, uh, as we mentioned before, the increase in the left atrial pressure, exceeding the uh, pulmonary pressure is resulting in pulmonary edema. Other thing also activation of the beta receptor will lead to myocardial dysfunction, myocardial stunning, and also necrosis leading to impaired LV function and pulmonary edema. Lastly, uh, the severe hypotension could result in endothelial injury activation of the inflammatory and coagulation cascade, as well as activation of the platelet. They will start to aggregate causing microemboli, they damage the endothelium further, and they can cause capillary leak and pulmonary edema. Uh, there is also a state of uh, inflammation that happens in uh, patients who uh, with brain dead uh, organ donor. It happens because of, as we mentioned, the endothelial injury, where uh, because of the shear forces, because of the severe hypertension, uh, leading to activation of the coagulation as well as the inflammatory cascade, releasing cytokines such as interleukin-6 and others, and also uh, the release of neuropeptides from the nerve ending uh, of the dead uh, brain tissue and also the leak of the necrotic brain tissue that will leak into the systemic circulation, uh, further worsening this inflammatory process. How about the hematological derangements? 
Uh, as we mentioned before, these patients are uh, prone to develop uh, multiple hematological derangements in terms of coagulopathy, DIC, and thrombocytopenia. So how does this happen? It happens through, uh, first, again, the severe hypertension causing endothelial injury and activation of the coagulation and inflammatory cascade. Uh, and leading to severe coagulopathy and a DIC-like picture, as well as the, re the release of the uh, necrotic brain tissue into the circulation. Once they leak, they uh, induce a severe inflammatory response as well, uh, causing a similar uh, DIC-like picture, coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia. This could also be worsened by the presence of hypothermia, and also hemodilution uh, due to massive resuscitation because uh, of hypotension and hemodynamic instability. Coming to the endocrine, uh, Dr. Raif already elaborated uh, on this extensively. Uh, so there is, uh, as we said before, the hypothalamus and the pituitary are affected during this process uh, and the uh, Thyroid hormone is really important to increase the cardiac output through um, inducing chronotropy via uh, beta adrenergic receptor upregulation. It can also increase the blood volume through activation of the renin and angiotensin aldosterone system and also increases the myocardial contractility via influx of calcium into the cardiac cells. So the neuroendocrine dysfunction can happen in up to 40% of patients uh, in those who have acute brain injury or in patients who are already brain dead uh, due to the diffuse brain injury, hemorrhage and herniation. And autopsy already showed uh, evidence of pituitary hemorrhage and necrosis in almost 80% of patients with traumatic brain injury. So the disruption of the pituitary axis, just in brief, can result in hypothyroidism state, uh, leading to uh, myocardial dysfunction, uh, at, uh, and also can lead to a metabolic derangement at the cellular level, as the thyroid hormone is really important for aerobic metabolism. Diabetes insipidus could also ensue from uh, the lack of vasopressin, and uh, also they could develop low cortisol. They have uh, insulin resistance, uh, and that's why they develop hyperglycemia. All of these changes could lead to endothelial activation, inflammatory cascade, and further worsening of the metabolic injury, and uh, also shifting the metabolism from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism and further progressive deterioration of the organ function. Uh, with that, I will end my talk and thank you very much. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Zainab. Uh, uh, there's one question. Uh, diabetic and hypertension patient can donate their organ for transplant? Uh, what is it again? Is a patient who have diabetes or high hypertension, can they donate, can be an organ donor? It's uh, absolutely a relative uh, uh, whether they will be able to donate or not. It all depends on the status of the organs. Uh, and also it depends on the uh, other uh, contraindication presence or no. Solo uh, diabetes or hypertension uh, probably will not be a contraindication for organ donation, especially if the organs are in a good state and there is no other contraindication for organ donation. Great. So as uh, everybody knows, uh, when we talk about uh, organ donation, brain death, it's really a multi-organ failure. And uh, you notice that we are trying to cover the management of each organ. And so you understand the physiology of each uh, part of the body, how it affects uh, this. Thank you, Dr. Zainab, and for being on time. And it's always a pleasure to hear you and to have you with us. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Zainab, do you mind uh, to stop sharing your screen?
Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to proceed with my next lecture. So I like uh, so. My name is uh, Dr. Jamil Ahmed Jamil. I'm ICU consultant at King Faisal Hospital. Uh, I uh, I'm really honored to be with uh, with you today. So I'm gonna yesterday. Probably, I'm sorry that we have some technical issue, and I'll try to go through quickly uh, about respiratory management, where I think it's very important for uh, everybody to understand the respiratory management. I'm gonna go through the first few slides since we discussed it. Uh, so uh, everybody know that uh, now there is many guidelines that uh, discuss about the brain death. And again, anybody interested, those are free, uh, 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 free uh, article that are in the system and uh, the computer, you can download it. If you have any problem, please uh, feel free to contact me. I'll be more than happy to send it. Definitely also Scott, they can help you with those and they have details about the management. So uh, the statement there recent uh, in April 2020, the Canadian, uh, they have a statement about uh, practice guideline about the uh, brain death and the Brazilian, they also published one uh, also last year. And uh, what's uh, really interesting about their statement, uh, they said intensivists need to play a vital role in the management of potential organ donor through identification of potential donor, declaration of brain death, and proper medical care, all of which can improve the rate of graft survival. And that statement is came from after many study that's showing interference of the intensive is very important. And I'm trying to focus on this, even I mentioned yesterday, because I received many questions from ER physician from different hospitals. If they receive a patient with brain death, what would they do? My advice is to contact uh, your intensivist or whoever have uh, experience uh, in managing brain organ to be able to do the proper diagnosis. And also you can always contact Scott where Dr. Bisher yesterday, he elaborated that there's somebody 24 seven able to answer your question who's on call from Scott. So uh, managing a, a brain death is not only uh, from uh, pulmonary or endocrine, it's basically multi-organ and Dr. Zainab, she elaborate on this uh, further. And why uh, we put a special lecture about pulmonary? Because unfortunately, the least organ that we can utilize uh, from organ, uh, from disease brain death is uh, basically the lung. And this is a study from 2019 showed only 10 to 20% of lung eligible for transplantation. So we're losing so many lungs. And unfortunately, we have a big program for uh, living donor, liver, and kidney. But the lung, only we depend on the disease donor. And we have so many people die because we cannot find a lung where they are lungs, but unfortunately that we can yeah, not utilize it. And the reason, because there is a huge number of those patients after they, uh, they declare a brain death, that their lungs are not usable, Partially is because uh, we are not managing the ventilator in a proper way. So uh, yesterday I mentioned about this cascade and this uh, cartoon tell you about the, how the brain death affect the organ. And we discussed also the standard, uh, the ideal lung donor criteria, which I'm gonna repeat it again, the age less than 55, uh, five, there is a clear chest X-ray, there is a normal gas exchange, with PO2 more than 300, and this is when you put patient on 100% oxygen, PO5. There's no chest trauma, no uh, evidence of aspiration. There's no secretion when you do bronchoscopy, and we'll discuss this uh, further. There is no organism on sputum gram stain, and this is also, we can discuss it in under the infectious disease lecture, uh, the last one. And there is no history of primary pulmonary disease or active pulmonary infection. Uh, if there is a smoker, but less than 25 years, this is a criteria, uh, ABO compatibility. There is no prior cardiopulmonary surgery. And this is because if there is a cardiopulmonary surgery, you might have a lot of adhesion of the lung 
and the lung cannot be utilized. And also common as the pulmonary is the size of the lung from the no donor to recipient. Now the uh, thoracic surgeon, they have a many way to really play uh, with uh, lung to cut it, to make it uh, more suitable. Definitely there is a complication, need a lot of experience. So uh, why if we need to assess the appropriate normal lung? So we have to have a normal chest X-ray. We have a PO2 of more than 400 or 300. When you put patient on 100% oxygen, the PF ratio need to be less, uh, more than 300. And we have to do bronchoscopy. There is, uh, the reason there is sometimes the X-ray is normal, that abnormal finding were found in almost 38% of donor even though the chest X-ray is uh, normal and the PO2 more than 400. And as you see by this is a picture of this uh, uh, secretion from the lung that's uh, after bronchoscopy. And uh, also it can help us to measure the, uh, uh, another reason to do measurement of pulmonary shock. So 37% uh, donor have an rate on the initial film and 51% resolve completely after proper donor management. That's why, uh, and then experience intensivist with proper infectious disease uh, team to be uh, with us with proper antibiotic is very essential. That's, uh, so this extra you see, there is a possibility that can be dissolved. Donor with a strong unilateral abnormality and chest X-ray should not be excluded for donation of the contralateral lung. So if you have a lung uh, disease in one lung, so you can still use one lung. Lung should be not be used if heavy pneumonic infiltrate are confirmed during organ retrieval. So we have to look into it case by case before we make the decision. So does everybody need a bronch? And the answer, yes. And this is one study found that bronchoscopy was Norm, abnormal in uh, almost 38% with normal x-ray and even the PO, uh, PO2 is about 400. What's the advantage also on top of looking to airway, if there is aspirate material, blood, purulent secretion, mucus blood, those something that you can clean and that can improve the lung ventilation. We have to look into the airway for abnormality. Maybe there is a small cancer, especially with uh, elderly people. Uh, and so when you do bronch, it's not like a regular bronch that you do to suction mute plug. You have to try to go to each segment from right upper lobe, go to uh, middle lobe, lower lobe, and same thing for the left. So this is very uh, intensive uh, inspection. Uh, and this is also people that can, you can train your fellows, sit with them, and this is excellent, but definitely this is not an indication we do it, but this will be helpful to uh, train your fellow. Uh, I'm not gonna say it as a statement because people they might question the ethic, if it's ethical, but definitely uh, with the present of consultant is uh, appropriate. So the bronchoscopy, uh, this is a study was uh, published in 1994, a total of 72 organ donor they have a uh, normal chest X-ray 51, and the PA uh, ratio was uh, elevated more than uh, as, uh, 300. And they have a normal bronchoscopy in 33% only. So the rest of the patient, they have abnormal. And if you can see those pictures, you can see the secretion, the mucus block, and if somebody trauma, they may have injury, they may have aspiration. So all this can, it's important to look at it. So abnormal finding, you can see inhalation of gastric content. You can see a blood, uh, pulmonary contusion, or purine bronchial secretion. Uh, I'll move here now for the benefit of single recruitment maneuver after an apnea test. If yesterday you listened to Dr. Kawi lecture talking about apnea testing and the criteria. In the past, we used to put uh, only the tubing with FI2, and keep the patient on. Now there is more advanced uh, and multiple study show that is not the ideal to do it directly. It's better to do also a recruitment. So uh, what we do, uh, the apnea test was associated with more diffuse in PF ratio. So when you remove the, vent the ventilator and put the tubing with the FI2 of 100% and eight liter flow, 
what they found after finishing the, the testing, there is a lot of uh, de-recruitment of the lung and that can damage uh, the potential lung donor. And ratio could be restored and this uh, thing we can restore it by doing recruitment maneuver and this is, will be done immediately after rec reconnecting to ventilator. And you can, uh, by, and by saying recruit maneuver, or some people they're gonna ask, is by saying, uh, by increasing PEEP, uh, like five, 10, 20, 30, up to 40, and for a few minutes. And you can see here how they increase uh, the PEEP gradually, and each uh, one for like one minute, and they start decreasing one minute. And this will help to open the de-recruiting one. And this is based on the study you can see, this is a study was controlled and this is recruitment. The PF ratio in the control was uh, low and after recruitment was better, uh, the lung was recruited better. And uh, so that's why I really highly recommend it to do a recruitment maneuver after doing uh, the, the, the apnea test. And this is another single recruitment uh, for diagnosis of brain death. This is percentage potential lung donor uh, because of BF ratio uh, 30. So the people, when they start doing recruitment, the number of lung that utilized was significantly uh, much higher than the other, sorry. So, so this is another study I'd like to present about, uh, this is a retrospective study and this is, was published uh, in the, uh, I think 2019, uh, to see uh, how much we are losing organ because of not proper management. And this is a ventilator setting in pulmonary status in 34 uh, potential organ donor. And in this study, they use a target volume of 10, nine to 10 of 12 or 12, and uh, also PF ratio, uh, was very uh, depend on the patient between uh, 100 up to 300. And uh, what they found basically before brain death and after the brain death, the team, they continue uh, the same management by not doing a special management for the uh, uh, brain death patient. And basically, based on the study, you can see here, there's a 34 potential multi-organ, and basically after uh, remove the other patient trauma or infection or age more than 65, there's 11 lung that potential. And because of poor management, orderly, they were able to use only two lung and nine patients basically were not able to use a lung. So you can imagine that if we're gonna give some of those patients one lung, so we could save 18 patients or at least nine patients if can I do double lung. So there is a huge uh, loss from this. So what if we start doing special protocol for lung donation? And basically they did the study by doing recruitment maneuver and uh, for giving the, as I mentioned in my previous study and using high P, Still, they're using here in this study data volume of 10, but they did other strategy, strategy by keeping the patient negative to neutral. And this is a debatable thing. And Dr. Rahmatullah, in her talk, she would mention this. Uh, also, they did aspiration pneumonia, chest physiotherapy, and bronchoscopy. And if you see here, basically pre-protocol, and this is protocol phase, the mean rate of lung recruitment from, jumped from 11.5 to 25.5%. And the number of transplant went from 53 to 121. So just by doing simple thing, they were able to improve the recruitment of the lung. So uh, 98 actual lung donor during the protocol period, 54% has initially been considered poor donor. And after proper management, 53% of the 121 lung transplant were uh, able to improve. So how should we ventilate the lung donor? And this is this, uh, another study when at this time they start looking into, uh, can we do anything special uh, like uh, lung uh, recruitment and uh, ARDS? 
management. And this is multi-center study was done from 2004 to 2009. And they use a conventional arm and protect the ventilation arm that we always discuss it in any ARDS by using six to eight mil per kg, using PEEP of six to eight. And they did the apnea test done on CPAP, not by removing the totally the machine. They kept the machine, the ventilator, but they put only CPAP, 100% oxygen and PEEP of five and with a closed circuit suction. And uh, this is a conventional arm, and this is a protective ventilation. The dead tidal volume, you can see six to eight, PEEP three to five, eight to 10. Apnea, you know, they did disconnect the ventilator, and they did here CPAP, and the suction open circuit and closed circuit. So what they found that the, this is a convention that's protective, they met lung donor eligibility initially was 54, and here were 95% with B value. The harvested lung was 27 and increased to 54%. So the survival of lung transplant recover was 69 uh, in those group and 75. So there is really potential that you, we can make a difference in uh, by doing a specialized protocol and ventilation. The same thing here uh, to say the six hour after event, uh, randomization, the lung harvested was 27 versus 54%, which tell you the big number that we benefit from that. So always put in your mind when you really ventilating the patient that you have limit distending in this area, we have to uh, keep the transpulmonary pressure and basically add PEEP, as we discussed, limit dial volume, not to overextend, and not to de-recruit the lung, and use six to eight mil per kg to any patient, and I mean it, any patient, uh, the plateau pressure to be less than 28 or less than 30, and uh, also peep around eight to 10 centimeter water. So uh, the idea is uh, this is the alveolar collapse, this is over distension, and the goal to stay in this limit, not uh, over distension. So uh, last not the least, I'm going to talk quickly about neurogenic pulmonary edema. When we have increased ICP, this will reflect on neurogenic pulmonary edema, can cause pulmonary dysfunction. And on top, the pulmonary dysfunction could be the contusion, pneumonia, aspiration, and ventilation-induced uh, lung injury. So uh, how are we going to manage uh, neurogenic pulmonary edema? by doing the protective lung strategy of six to eight or lower, use uh, judicially very carefully diuretic. Uh, Sometimes you can use ventolamine and beta adrenergic agonist, dopamine or dobutamine, and we'll discuss this in the hemodynamic part. And sometimes there is controversial about using some Narcan. Uh, personally, I never use it. So in conclusion, uh, any patient, you have in your ICU with brain death, I would really recommend the form. Use a tata volume of six to eight mil per kg. Okay. Use a PIP less than 30 and plateau that less than 28 or less than 30. Try to use optimal PEEP to allow minimum FIO2 around eight, uh, five, eight, up to 10 centimeter. If, if you want to do recruitment, you can go higher. Uh, FI to, to adjust it to keep saturation 96. You don't want to see 100%, so 96% is a good goal. A PO2 more than 100, keep FI to at least uh, at the lowest setting you can. There's a lot of talk about the oxygen toxicity. We never seen it, but maybe we are not seeing it because there's other cofactor playing a role. Recruitment maneuver initially and repeat after apnea testing or tracheal suction close circuit suctioning so you don't de-recruit the patient, maintain tracheal cuff pressure around 25 centimeter. And this is because you don't want to cause a damage to the trachea and cause the trachea or stenosis. Head of the bed elevated to reduce the risk of aspiration, avoid the administration of excessive IV fluid. So keep it neutral and consider some diuretic if there is some fluid overload. With this, I will conclude my lecture and uh, I'm ready for any question. Let's see.
Thank you very much, Dr. Riaz, this very elegant and uh, interesting talk. Uh, if you allow me one question. Yeah, go ahead, definitely. Uh, about the recruitment maneuver, since yeah. it is really long protective and important one, do you advise to update the guidelines for this declaration by adding this one on apnea tests? I think this is uh, looking at the data right now. I think the, the guideline we have to adjust it because in the past, most of us we do uh, disconnect the patient from the ventilator, put the tube oxygen of uh, like a 15 or eight to 15 liter and repeat the blood gas to see CO2. Uh, after reviewing all the evidence and personally what I did basically, and this is one of the questions. So I put the patient on pressure support of zero and put only on the ventilator, switch him to CPAP of five, 100% of I2, and keep it on close circuit to suction and basically do the apnea test. Uh, people, they may say this is ventilation. No, there is no ventilation. All what you're doing is to keep the alveoli open and to give good oxygenation, but CO2 will go up. So ventilation would not affect and would not affect the test. So again, repeat it. Put the ventilator on mode of CPAP, put the CPAP of five, 100% oxygen, and do the same protocol as when you uh, disconnect the patient. Okay, thank you. I think there is one question about the same. Uh, for apnea test, can I yeah, put the patient the on CPAP with PS0, PIP0? To do the test or not? Yeah, and that's what I answer. So basically, we do, but put the pressure support zero at the peep of zero. Peep is the same as uh, CPAP. So when you put the machine on CPAP, so this is uh, you don't see the pressure support. So the mod CPAP and the peep is five. So the CPAP of uh, zero, it's a CPAP of five. Okay. Very clear. Thank you. One more. I think that's the questionnaire. So I, I think uh, to proceed, we don't want to delay. So uh, everybody, I think, get tired after a long day of work. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Amira Rahmatullah. She is also uh, one of our consultant, uh, critical care. Uh, Dr. Amira, she's a board of fine pulmonary critical care from Duke University. Uh, basically, Dr. Amira, she will discuss uh, the hemodynamic support of brain death donor. Dr. Amira also is a program director for our residency program. Uh, we would like to welcome her. Dr. Amira, are you with us? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jimmy, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mission and Dr. Talal as well for having me here. Uh, I mean, and thank you for hosting such a good course. Uh, it's an honor to be with you all, and thank you for all the attendees to be here. Uh, let me share my screen uh, here, and then there, yeah, share that. One. And um, do you do you see my screen? Is that yes? Perfect. Okay. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, it's a pretty controversial topic, so bear with me on uh, this one. Uh, the objectives, I'm going to go over the physiological changes that happens with um, uh, brain dead patients uh, and then the tools that are required for hemodynamic monitoring, the management of the instability that happens due to these uh, physiological changes, and finally the strategies um, that would help us improve uh, uh, procurement of um, uh, transplantable organs and, and better quality. Uh, so uh, just a quick review on the pathophysiology. I know this is a very common uh, slide that we, that we see in, in the latest guidelines. Um, but I'll just focus on the hemodynamic part of it. Uh, so um, as we all know, the hemodynamic response after brain death is uh, very well uh, described. Um, and the initial um, devastating uh, injury to the brain or brain stem causes a, um, a massive immediate activation of the um, sympathetic nervous system. And this technically uh, leads to um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, sympathetic storm. Uh, which is basically in the form of um, hypertension, technical blood pressures more than 180 to 100 systolic, uh, tachycardia, um, um, and uh, this would obviously increase the uh, cardiac afterload. That will lead to an increase in the in the allied pressure that would ultimately increase the pulmonary capillary wet pressure in the heart and in the lungs, 
and so uh, which would lead to uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction constriction and endothelial damage. And this whole cascade just becomes a vicious cycle and it causes more and more injury. Um, this sympathetic storm also causes some myocardial damage uh, and uh, that contributes to um, uh, most of our respiratory problems that Dr. Jameen has just, just discussed. Uh, so uh, with this sympathetic storm, uh, I would just like to mention that, um, you know, to, to mitigate this response, um, there are some, some studies. Um, I, this is a small uh, retrospective study that, that had 152 patients total and 46 were actually randomized. Uh, to, to, to receive um, uh, short-acting um, uh, beta agonists, so esmolol, uh, uh, beta blockers, sorry. Uh, it's a ret retrospective study, as I mentioned, 63% um, of potential heart donors exhibited clinical signs that consistent with um, this uh, sympathetic uh, storm. Uh, the cardiac harvesting was performed in 28 uh, donors, which is 61%. And the treatment um, with of this autonomic uh, storm was associated with actually higher LV ejection fraction values and an increase in probability of the heart harvesting and transplantation. But again, um, we cannot generalize this because we do need a better uh, randomized controlled trials uh, to to really to put this into consideration. But this is just something to keep in mind um, that if you uh, have a patient with um, a uh, an, an, a sympathetic storm. Um, which will eventually be followed with physioplegia, uh, hypotension, and bradycardia. You want to avoid um, using longer-acting agents, so esmolol would be the, the, the way to go. Uh, when it comes to hemodynamic monitoring, um, the tools and, and uh, targets. Um, so uh, um, again, there are no major studies that dictate which types of monitoring should be applied uh, to brain-dead donors. Uh, but the common sense is that it's an extrapolation from other shock states. So most of the studies that were done were done uh, not in, in the good quality studies, I mean, not, not in organ donors, but, but rather in other uh, uh, shock states, patients who are not afraid of So um, this, uh, of course, from the critical care medicine, the management is just some guidelines for the management of potential organ donor in the ICU. And um, um, uh, the, the main thing is basically uh, the steps to, to follow is fluid responsiveness and, and volume status. So we want to make sure they're uh, optimized. And um, we want to make sure that they don't have a, a stunned myocardium or some neurogenic um, myocardial dysfunction. Uh, so we want to augment their cardiac output and make sure that they have a good tissue perfusion. Uh, one, um, you know, every time we apply the basics of hemodynamic monitoring, especially the um, uh, uh, the uh, pulse pressure uh, variation or stroke volume variation, um, uh, and of course the invasive blood pressure monitoring and all that, um, we it, it, it roams around this one basic um, physiological concept that we need to understand, which is the um, uh, heart and lung. Uh, interaction during passive pressure ventilation. Uh, so what happens is that the, um, as we put in uh, passive pressure ventilation uh, into our patients, uh, we increase their transpulmonary and pleural pressures. Um, this, uh, this leads to an increase in the RV uh, afterload um, and decrease in the RV preload. Um, uh, and eventually after a few heartbeats, of course, this will lead to a decrease in the RV stroke volume. Uh, and if you have a, a decrease in the RV stroke volume, the filling pressures in the left ventricle would decrease. So a few heartbeats out, like two to three heartbeats, you have a low um, uh, in stroke volume from the LV side, and, and that's why you, you end up with um, hypotension. And this is basically more um, prominent uh, in the expiratory phase of, of, uh, of the cycle. So every time we cycle our patients with the breath in, breath out, if this pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation is high, uh, that means they are more on the uh, steeper curve of the prime starting curve. As, as you all know, this curve is... Um, Usually when patients are on the steeper side, um, they're volume responsive, their um, uh, pulse pressure variation is high, their stroke volume variation is high, their cardiac output is low. And as you um, uh, give them more fluids, uh, monitoring these parameters, uh, then you would start getting them more on the plateau side where the uh, pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation start to decrease and your cardiac output start to increase. But then eventually, you don't see much of that response. So that's when we need to stop. Uh, that means we've, uh, we've already reached where we wanna reach in terms of volume status.
So again, when it comes to the tools, we look at the pulse pressure variation, which you can derive from an arterial catheter. So we would need an, an arterial line in all our patients. Um, this is basically, um, uh, you look at the, the maximum, uh, so it's uh, systolic minus the diastolic, so you get the maximum systolic, maximum diastolic, and then you subtract it from the minimum values and then divide it by the mean. Um, this has some restrictions. Uh, again, this is extrapolated from other shock states, but uh, our uh, patients' population in this topic are not going to breathe on their own, so you're not going to have any trouble there. Uh, they should be um, uh, a fully controlled mechanical ventilation. They're not spontaneously breathing, and they would be getting more than uh, or equal to eight mils per keg, so less than six mils per keg predicted body weight. Um, the sensitivity to the uh, pulse pressure variation would be lower. Uh, they should be in sinus rhythm, uh, and anything more than 15% is actually strongly associated with volume responsiveness with a sensitivity and specificity of 88% each. Uh, and then the stroke volume variation as well, the same thing, uh, more than 10% is associated with fluid responsiveness with a sensitivity and specificity of, more of uh, 94% each. The, um, then we have the provocative maneuvers. Uh, these includes the IV fluid bolus and the passive leg raising. And it would be ideal to, to do these two maneuvers uh, while you're monitoring the uh, pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation or the cardiac output. While you monitor those, you, you do the provocative maneuvers. You either give 250 to 500 mils of uh, saline or do the passive leg raising. The, raising test, um, and uh, that would show you that if the, um, the uh, PPV or the SVV decrease and the cardiac output increase, that means you are in the uh, steep curve of the Star uh, Frank Sterling curve. Um, otherwise, you're on, the, or you're on the fuller side, and so you should, you should avoid uh, fluids. IVC assessments, unfortunately, there were more than 30 studies that really showed um, the sensitivity is not as great, 71% and, and specificity of 75%. Um, and you know it's it's um, it's uh, it's operator dependent. Um, uh, you really need to measure the IVC diameter um, as as at the junction of the IVC with with the right atrium. And it looks uh, it should be about two centimeters. And if there is some collapsibility of about eighteen percent, uh, then that would signify uh, fluid um, responsiveness. And if, it, if there's no uh, variation uh, with with cyclic changes in, in your in your breaths uh, in, and, in and out, then uh, that means you're more on the steeper side of the uh, Frank Sterling curve. Uh, you know, the, uh, the other thing I would like to mention is because of the specificity and sensitivity of, of the IVC assessment, I know most of us do use it and it's pretty easy to do at bedside. I would, um, uh, I would think that it would be the best approach is that every patient is individualized. Every patient uh, has a specific organ dysfunction, their clinical examination. Um, I think we should put all these um, uh, in, in, uh, in context together. Um, and if the IVC assessment shows um, extreme results, so if it's either too low or too high, then that, I think that would add uh, to the information that, that we would want to achieve. Uh, there are other, uh, so, you know, with the, with the pulse pressure variation, the stroke volume variation, you can derive the, these values from the arterial catheter. And there are some, um, if, if, if you get the arterial compliance and the systemic vascular resistance, you can actually calculate the SVV. Uh, but there are some devices um, that, uh, such as the PICO, um, that is common uh, right now, uh, that would actually calculate for you the cardiac index, cardiac output, and the systemic vascular resistance. Um, and, uh, um, and the stroke volume variation as well. So, but this, again, it really depends on, the, I have to mention it's an extrapolation for other shock states and it depends on the resources that you have in your own center. So I think going with um, uh, the history, the physical examination, the lactate, uh, the pulse pressure variation, invasive blood pressure monitoring is an arterial line. And um, uh, in addition to um, uh, the IVC assessments, I think putting them all together would, uh, would, would be adequate. Uh, echo is usually done for all patients who are diagnosed with brain death, and usually those who have an ejection fraction of less than uh, 45%. Um, would need a repeated uh, serial echocardiograms because um, you want to make sure that they, it's not just a stunned myocardium or a neurogenic uh, myocardial uh, injury. Uh, so usually those, they do uh, improve uh, on, on serial measurements, so uh, we, we should continue on, on, on doing echocardiograms. 
uh, cardiac specific management, um, um, every donor, as I mentioned, should have an echocardiogram performed. You have to assess the state of the myocardium and identify other cardiac pathologies. If the initial echo shows an ejection fraction of less than 45, you should start for, um, hormone replacement therapy and perform serial echocardiogram to assess this function. Uh, if it's not adequate or it's technically difficult, then you have the transesophageal echo is always another option. Um, and when it comes to um, uh, cardiac cath, it's not recommended for all patients, but patients who are older donors of more than 40 years or younger with um, established risk factors for premature CAD. Um, there's no clear recommendations on really checking uh, serial levels of uh, pro-BNP, troponins, and CK, uh, so there's no recommendation regarding that. So the primary goal eventually is to um, optimize the number and long-term function of our transplanted organs. And in summary of what I mentioned, we uh, monitor every patient as in any uh, intensive care unit with continuous monitoring of temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, rhythm, uh, saturations, and urine output, arterial line uh, for continuous invasive blood pressure monitoring, and the, the central venous catheter for uh, central um, uh, the CVP and the, and the central venous sacs. Uh, PAC is only done in selected patients um, who, um, you know, um, who, who have heart failure, who are difficult to manage, who um, whom basic um, maneuvers are not are not enough, um, and you are really considering a, a heart transplant. So I think that would be something uh, that you would consider then. Uh, the the, uh, the targets are usually we would we would uh, according to all the studies that I've been, uh, that I went through. Um, uh, hypothermia, more on the hypothermia side of uh, 35 to 36 degrees would be acceptable. MAP of 60 uh, and above, uh, CP, CPP of 12 and above. So most of the studies have mentioned um, uh, 6, to, 6 to 10 and a, a pulmonary um, artery uh, opening pressure or pulmonary capillary watch pressure of uh, less than 12. A systemic vascular resistance of 800 to um, 1200, uh, 800 to 1200 uh, dimes. Urine output of more than one mils per kg per hour and a stroke volume variation, we want it to be lower than 12%, cardiac index of more than 2.5, and a central venous stats of more than 70%. These are just the general uh, goals that we actually do for any patient with uh, who's in shock. Uh, this is from the Indian Journal of Anesthesia. They just wanted to make it easier for you than me complicating things. Um, the, uh, the, the rule of 100, so um, uh, SDP of more than 100 urine output, a uh, uh, heart rate of less than 100 urine output of more than 100 mils an hour, PAO2 of more than 100, and hemoglobin of more than 100. But I have some reservations about this hemoglobin because um, most of the studies have also suggested not to transfuse if the hemoglobin is more than 70, and to, the, to be reasonable that we would target 70 and above. Uh, but I think they're just trying to simplify things. So that this is just to show you that um, there are no uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, these trials are uh, basically, um, their, their evidence in organ tenure they should have not that strong. Uh, so this is just an extrapolation again. Uh, when it comes to fluid status, um, we have so many organs that um, most of my colleagues have spoke with me, uh, have spoke about it before, before me, um, uh, including the heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, pancreas, bowel donations, and each one responds differently to fluid statuses. And there's still controversies about this as well. So a lot of people say that, okay, for, you know, for the bowel, it loves the fluids, the liver as well, the pancreas, you don't want to cause pancreatic edema if you want to harvest the pancreas. Kidneys, um, not too, yeah, I mean, a CVP of 10 to 12, or actually uh, a normal bulimia would be better. Lungs, more on the drier side, and on the heart is, is, is as, as the kidneys, you don't want to overload it either. So um, it's quite different on, so again, we have to individualize it for patients and what organ failures that they have and what are the organs that we are looking to harvest. Um, but uh, uh, this is exactly what I've just mentioned um, uh, 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 the, the previous slide. So when it comes to the fluids, um, with protocolized fluid therapy, increase the number of organs uh, transplanted. Now they did a, uh, they started a, the monitor trial, protocolized fluid therapy in brain dead donors. It's a multi-center randomized trial, but unfortunately it stopped early uh, because of the uh, lack of resources and it showed negative results. And that a protocolized approach is not superior to conventional therapy. Um, that, that was unfortunate. So again, there's no clear uh, cut protocol that we could follow for this. 
The fluids of choice that we would give is uh, crystalloids. These are the, the first, um, uh, our first option that we'd use. If you want some more of colloids, volume expansion, which are the second line, then albumin 5% uh, would do. We would avoid uh, the hydro uh, hydroxyethyl starch because it has negative consequences on the kidneys, as we all know that. The blood products um, based on PRN basis, and as I mentioned, a goal of more than seven uh, grams per deciliter is, is, is acceptable. And again, uh, we try to um, uh, target eubulimia um, more often than, than uh, we don't want to flood them and we don't want to get, get them on the drier side. So um, uh, liberal versus restrictive fluid administration on the lungs versus the kidneys. So this was a study that looked at the impact of restrictive fluid balance focused to increase the lung procurement uh, on renal function after kidney transplantation. And this basically, um, so uh, it was a retrospective uh, review, 440 kidney recipients, and they looked at the effects of restrictive fluid balance with a CVP target of less than six in brain dead donors and how that impacted those patients with renal transplants. So uh, here, the people who had a CVP of less than six, and those are the people who had a CVP of more than six, uh, fluid balance from brain death to OR was 480 in this group and about 800 double in, in this group. And it showed no difference in either graft survival or delayed graft function. So um, when nothing works, you know, you've done your parts, you monitored them, you gave them some fluids, uh, you, you ensured the eubulimia, but they're still hypotensive, possibly because of some myocardial like dysfunctions and vasoplegia, then we would go towards inotropes and vasopressors. So here our target is um, to target a cardiac index of more than 2.5. Uh, hormonal resuscitation, as uh, Dr. Raif has spoke about, and uh, vasoactive infusions uh, with dopamine, vasopressin, and lipofed on the top of the list. This is to optimize the cardiac output um, uh, and, and, of course, optimize the blood pressure uh, with the same vasoactive uh, infusions. Now, the bradycardia, um, uh, because with the, um, the, the brainstem, uh, uh, with the brainstem that the vagal nuclei are involved. And so the sympathetic nervous system is the only uh, system that actually influences the heart rate. And hence the atropine does not work with these patients. It's an antivagal uh, medication. So uh, you would go with isoproterenol uh, instead you know, for such patients with bradycardia. And uh, um, the, uh, when it comes to pressors, the first line agents that are used in most of the studies is um, uh, dopamine when you have cardiac dysfunction but with an EF of less than 45% and vasopressin if you have a low systemic vascular resistance. Uh, and if the vasopressin doesn't work or the dopamine, then you would go with levofed. So this is the, the use of dopamine effect, uh, effect um, on the, the kidney graft function. Uh, uh, this was um, published in the American Journal of Transplantation that showed it's a retrospective data over 13 years. They looked at uh, 254 consecutive patients from uh, cadaveric donors. And as you can see here, this is the serum creatinine and this is the fifth day after transplant. People who got dopamine had lower serum creatinine levels. And this is the uh, graft survival up to 15 years after transplantation. And those who got dopamine had better uh, graft survival compared to those who did not. Uh, so does dopamine use um, reduce dialysis requirements following renal transplants? Uh, this study uh, did show a positive results. Uh, so it's a prospective multicenter trial and there were 20, 264 brain dead donors resulted in 487 kidney transplants. Dopamine was administered as a continuous infusion with a standard rate of four uh, until cross clamping. And the need for multiple dialysis sessions was significantly reduced in those who were treated with dopamine. So this um, is the uh, intention to treat and, and for protocol analysis. And you could see here um, uh, time after transplantation in days and in, in all categories. This is the cumulative mortality and this is the patients requiring um, hemofiltration. Uh, and as you can see, the blue one are the people who got dopamine, and it's it's both um, the they require less hemofiltration, and their cumulative mortalities were less uh, compared to those who did not get it. So um, when it comes to vasopressin, we all know it's a peptide hormone, and it works on three different receptors, causing vasoconstriction, increased increased uh, fluid resorption, and um, of course it regulates the production of ACTH. 
The traditional uses for it is diabetes insipidus, which is very common in patients with uh, who, have, who are brain dead, and septic shock as an adjunct therapy to levofed. So does vasopressin have a role to play in the management of brain dead organ donors? Um, uh, there are 24 brain dead organ donors uh, with infusion of AVP versus saline. Um, and in that study, it showed that they had a plasma hyperosmolality was decreased, the blood pressure increased, the inotrope use was decreased, and the cardiac output was maintained. It doesn't really affect the cardiac output. So. Uh, does the use of um, vasopressin have an impact on or organ recovery rates? Um, this is another study published in the American Journal of Surgery. Um, uh, and they were looking at the arginine vasopressin um, that it did significantly increase the rate of successful organ procurement in potential donors. And uh, looking at this, this is another, another organ procurement and transplantation network um, where donors were treated with hormone replacement therapy and vasopressors. Um, uh, there are like uh, um, 10,000, uh, about more than 10,000 people. And here it actually shows you that the organs recovered in those who were AVP positive, who were treated with AVP, and those are the ones with AVP negative. So you can see the, the organs recovered um, who are on AVP positive, uh, and, and, and the yield of procurements were much higher in those, pati in those patients who were actually treated with AVP. The other uh, pressors, um, and the norepi, epi, and phenylephrine, they're considered second line. And that's because um, uh, uh, these, uh, they have a higher risk of um, uh, uh, pulmonary capillary uh, permeability is increased with, with use of these medications, increased incidence of dysenteric ischemia, increased incidence of coronary vasoconstriction, and um, norepi has been associated with reduced um, heart recipient survival. So we usually try to avoid these unless it is necessary after using the first line agents. Well, the arrhythmia management, there's not much to, um, to add here. Uh, there's no, I mean, for brain dead donors, it's, 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 it's the same uh, management for those who are um, uh, alive. Uh, so we use the ACLS guidelines. Um, uh, however, uh, as I mentioned, the autonomic storm is followed by the cardiovascular collapse. So please try to avoid uh, long-term, uh, long-acting agents. Uh, and it usually lasts about 15 to 30 minutes. So esmolol would be a one, one good um, uh, choice to go here. And the Brady arrhythmia may be refractory to atropine, so just keep that in mind. Uh, ventricular arrhythmias um, can be seen with hypothermia, and usually it does get better with rewarming. And again, follow the ACLS guidelines uh, apart from these two points um, uh, that I've uh, mentioned. Uh, so again, aggressive hemodynamic support, um, the, the resources that you have, the tools that you have to, to monitor um, their hemodynamic status, make sure that their fluid status is optimized, try not to over flood them or keep them on the drier side. Um, uh, we optimize their cardiac output, their tissue oxygenation, um, and their blood pressure as well. Uh, keep in mind dopamine for people who have cardiac dysfunction and vasopressin for those who have low systemic vascular resistance. Um, this is just, uh, um, uh, uh, again, this is just, you know, uh, we need a better quality of evidence, basically, but this is a flow chart that we actually uh, follow in King Faisal Hospital. Uh, this is the hemodynamic management, so arterial catheter for monitoring, CVP catheter, non-invasive cardiac output devices. Uh, that we can use um, a target goals map of more than 60, cardiac index of more than 2.4, CVP of 6 to 8, with an LV ejection fraction of more than 45. Um, usually the fluids, we start with crystalloids first, and then we go for uh, colloids, mainly the albumin 5%. Uh, vasoactive dopamine and vasopressin are, um, uh, these are the two um, uh, choices that we have depending on your cardiac function, and the second line would be the norepi and the rest of the uh, pressors. Uh, thank you so much. This is the <laughs> end of my talk. If there are any questions, thank should, you. I, should, I, should I stop sharing my screen? Yeah. Okay, yeah. but how do I do that? Stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramira. <clears throat> uh, I will start uh, with one question, and this is, uh, I think it's controversial and also is a uh, cause a lot of challenge in. Uh, the ICU is when the patient come in, most of those patients, they become hypernatremic. This is one of the challenges we face on those patients. And uh, because of the, we do is a sort of a, a salt wasting or basically HSD, uh, SIDH. So how we manage to give the fluid in those situations? 
is based on the sodium. Is there any risk for worsening uh, the lung? I know it's a controversial, but what's your experience with this? Um, it is. It is. It is a really tough, uh, tough one. Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> it's a good question, <laughs> but um, I, I think we should first diagnose them on why they have uh, 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 hyperosmolality and hypernatremia. Uh, most of these patients, if, I mean, if they have a high urine output of more than um, uh, 200 mils an hour, or, or at least more than 150, we would start suspecting that. Um, uh, then it, it could be just a diabetes insipidus. They just lose fluids and they have hypernatremia and that would be first treated with a TDAVP of hormonal replacement and after that correction we would actually uh, um, um, chase them with the, with, with the volume they need depending on the uh, again the stroke volume variation cardiac output and the uh, pulse pressure variation and make sure that we catch up with their fluid losses because as we as we fix the underlying cause of this hyperosmolality um, uh, I think the the um, we replace the flows that they've lost um, during this uh, process, and then they start to become uh, eubulimic uh, as we treat the underlying condition. Does that, does that answer the question? Thank you so much. So uh, I think uh, no further question. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Amira, uh, for your lecture. Uh, we appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's our pleasure. So our, uh, basically, I'm going to conclude this uh, session today. Uh, so people are that, again, they're very exhausted, tired, so we're trying to be ahead of schedule. And uh, our, our last, my last lecture is going to be out of, uh, since we have some uh, problem yesterday with the internet, I'm going to talk about infectious disease. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so this is, uh, I'd like to give the credit to Dr. Reem Arabi. She's uh, one of our transplant infectious disease and uh, King Faisal. And so uh, for emergency, she was not able to be with us today. Uh, but uh, let me talk a little bit in this lecture, I'm gonna focus mostly about the infection that can be potential donor. We might not go into specifically what antibiotic, but in kind of enlightenment about few issues that you're gonna face when you diagnose uh, a brain in death during this time. So uh, there is always, you have to look into the connection between the donor and the recipient and how you are gonna find the proper treatment for the donor in a way not to affect the recipient and I'll give a scenario about those uh, things. So always we're gonna find, try to find the balance between the organ availability and the risk of infection. Because we don't wanna take and say, okay, I'm gonna uh, transplant this patient, but I don't wanna uh, really affect the, lose the organ, so I need to find this balance. So by the Italian National Transplant, uh, they have a nice uh, uh, guideline that they discuss about a different issue and the way they said it that and some unacceptable risk and uh, those are patient like HIV infection, uh, metastatic cancer and treatable systemic infection. Those are unacceptable risk that we can say we are not going to take this organ. There is increased but acceptable. So in this situation, you have to look into risk benefit. And this, uh, this section will come also a lot of COVID patients. And today I spent a lot of time searching about the now uh, because we're having a lot of hot topic, everybody asking about the COVID and organ transplant. Maybe I can, uh, by the end of the lecture, uh, mention a few points about this COVID and organ transplantation. And uh, calculated risk, uh, basically, uh, basically, those are we can give a prophylaxis before we uh, percute our organ. Standard risk, uh, there is no infection, and basically we use uh, the organ. And there is some always a gray area that we cannot really assess the risk of infection. Okay. Uh, who's the donor? Most of the time, we get the patient, and this is one of the uh, questions from the audience. So this is to be a trauma that patient have severe head to trauma, end up with brain death, 
or basically they have vascular event in this patient may be they have intercerebral bleeding, they have aneurysmal bleeding and causes or uh, massive CDA and this causes a vascular event or suddenly you receive a patient, decrease level of consciousness and uh, basically we'll talk about more in this part and this all can cause brain death. Remember the diagnosis of brain death is uh, uh, basically purely patient. They might still have hemodynamically stability, even their hypotensive because of the event of the brain, but really the rest of the organ pretty much stable. So I'm gonna give this scenario, and this is a patient I personally manage him ever at King Castle Hospital uh, back in 2014. So he's a 19 year old male patient. He got a liver transplantation back in 2000, December 2014. And he presented to the ER March 18, after four months in 2015, with change in mental status. He developed dystonia. And remember, I saw him first time in the emergency department. The ID team were consulted and started to collect more information about other donor and other recipients because it was weird why he had this uh, neurologic uh, symptoms. We don't see this uh, uh, happen. So we start digging more to get uh, really more information. So what we discovered at that time that there is a patient who received heart transplant uh, done also at the same time, died one month earlier, and he received the organ from the same donor of the liver. And he was admitted also with behavior change. And also we discovered there's a renal transplant in Kuwait from the same donor also was admitted with meningitis and encephalitis. So when we look into who is a donor, we, uh, he was a 28 years old Indian with history of hypertension, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, and obesity. And he was admitted in November 2014 with ARDS. The patient when uh, was admitted, he had seizure during hospitalization. So this is brought, is there any risk of rabies encephalitis? And at that time, a brain biopsy done and showed uh, the rabies in the brain biopsy. So whenever you, uh, you have a patient with uh, CNS vascular band or decreased level of consciousness, you have to look into what the diagnosis, what uh, are the donor risk factors, and does he have a risk factor per vascular event or basically he doesn't? Uh, does he have a fever at presentation? Does he have a seizure? All this question need to be answered uh, before we uh, to have the final and to know the underlying diagnosis. So if we're gonna look into the differentiation between encephalopathy and encephalitis, I thought to put this uh, together. So fever in encephalopathy is in common, comparing with encephalitis. Headache is also in common. Encephalitis, they have a headache. Depressed mental status, there is the steady deterioration and encephalitis may fluctuate. The most uh, two things that I need, uh, and I highlight them, the focal neurologic sign, they're in common in encephalopathy, but they're very common in encephalitis. And type of seizure, encephalopathy will be generalized comparing with encephalitis, generalized or focal. Other thing that you look into it, uh, look at blood, the leukocyte and uh, pleocytosis, diffuse flowing by EEG and uh, the MRI in encephalopathy is often normal comparing with encephalitis. So when you see high WBC, uh, pleocytosis and diffuse flowing and focal abnormality, you might think about encephalitis more. So this is actually the brain uh, uh, CT of this patient. And you can see the gray matter, how there is some abnormality and in CT, which uh, raise really a suspicion that this, uh, there is some etiology in the brain could be infection and because we're highly, uh, this is contagious to the recipient. Another thing that you have to think about it, which is not common, but I think you have to look into it. This is a New England journal, and this published a while ago. And there's two cases. The first case was 51 years old man who had been found unresponsive 
with apparent head trauma. The CT of the brain will be a large right side subdural hematoma with a midline shift. And the other one is the donor was 45 years old woman with hypertension who had presented to the emergency department with five days history of right sided headache and acute left sided weakness. She was alert, uh, alert and improvised and had left sided hemiparesis. CT of the brain revealed an infarct in the distribution of the right middle server artery. Those two cases are patients when we dig, they dig more, they were not like typical of vascular paths because of age, the risk factor. And this is when they did the lab test basically. And later on follow up, those two patients, they have the lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. And if somebody doesn't know, this is a virus was discovered in 1933. And this is a come from the rodent. And people, they might have pets at home, and this is how they feel. It's not very common, but sometimes they have this uh, uh, house uh, mouse, they put it in the cage, especially kids, and this is how you can uh, get those. So really a good history about what type of pet, and I'll mention this is very important. In 2019, two Scott recipients one kidney and one liver. They present to their local hospital in Eastern Province with new onset procedure with decreased level of consciousness. They have neurologic feature consistent with rabies too. And the donor had died in 2018 with end diagnosis and supply encephalitis. So we, they did not get the reason of brain death in this patient and they recruit his organ and because it was not, uh, we didn't have really a good history. Those are very rare cases, not very common. So you have to think about Neisseria meningitis, Streptococcus pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, and E. coli in those patients when you suspect encephalitis, and maybe you have to do spinal tap. There is high virulent or intercept organism, such as Listeria species, if your hospital center you worry about this thing. The potential donor need to be microbiologically a biologically active antibiotic 24 to 48 hours before uh, the diagnosis. So recipient typically treated with seven to 14 days with antibiotic directed at cultural organisms. So those patients, you have to do a spinal tap, you have to try to find the diagnosis if you suspect encephalitis, they have to be treated with antibiotic at least 14 days before you can consider them as a donor. So uh, this is a basically uh, a study was published from King Kessel Hospital. This is, a, is a, in 2010. And this is multi-recipient and donor transplanted to tuberculosis. This is another disease that we gonna really talk about it. And I'll tell you just recently, we have not like organ, you have a bone marrow transplant, a guy, that he started having ARDS sick. And basically we did the bone marrow for him to find out what's going on. And he ended up with positive DB. And when we brought him basically was positive. So the, the donor for those are the solid organ. They were from Indonesia. And they have, a, a, the patient have negative PPD skin test and chest X-ray on arrival to the kingdom. Five, five months later, he was admitted with fever and change of mental status. You have a negative MRI and CCS was done and uh, was pretty much normal, except you have a high protein. So if you look into the study, this is a study showed the donor derived uh, MTB after sold organ transplant. And you can look here in the donor recipient, the latent TB even uh, is less likely to be transmitted but you have to suspect a president in endemic country and lower socioeconomic uh, area that there is high possibility they might have, have microbacteria uh, tuberculosis. And we have a lot of patients that post-transplant, we put them on protocol for treatment of TB. So when we look into high suspicious, you look here, we have, uh, the, in the uh, pandemic area, the endemic area like Africa, the spreading is around 300 per 100,000. When you go to India, Pakistan, South Asia, or Afghanistan, it's around 100 to 300 per 100,000. 
in China down to 100. So yeah, our rate of or, uh, for TB could be around 50 per 100,000. When you go to North America, Europe can be less than 25. So when you have an index of suspicious, the more you are in this area of those uh, country, really you have to think about uh, latent TB. But think about homeless, think about incarcerated, prior TB history, contact with TB, or patient have history of alcoholism. So uh, as we discuss again, if you have a, a reason of brain death, a trauma or vascular event, or disease level of consciousness, cause of brain death, a, a patient will be critically ill if they're high risk or hospital acquired infection or latent TB. Those are three things that you have to think in any of those patients when they're severely sick. Either are they harboring some infection or do they have a latent infection? Or basically after a few days being in the hospital, they have hospital acquired infection. So always get a good history. Find out if you have a pet, what type of job he's doing, and try because history really can give you a good information about the patient. Uh, so this is another uh, scenario during the weekend on call. The ID team received a call from the liver transplant coordinator. There's a potential donor, but he have a bacteremia, a bacteremia, and the verbal report showed that MRSA. So the ID automatically MRSA, nice, let's give him IV vancomycin in addition to surgical prophylaxis uh, after they do the transplant. Next, uh, uh, next day, the patient he received vancomycin and we have seven uh, recipients for this patient. First, after that, personal communication between ID team and from the referring hospital, they discover that the donor have a BRE and the recipient right away were switched to target therapy uh, four days later after that. So the sensitivity unfortunately showed resistant except for the linozolid and the uh, dalforperstein. So adult liver transplant, those in adult, they persisted to have bacteremia on one week from the surgical side infection and intra-abdominal infection. So the pediatric liver tra uh, transplant recipient, he continued to have persistent bacteria for two weeks, but unfortunately have a liver necrosis and uh, he required another retransplantation three weeks later. So 14% of donors are colonized or infected at the time of harvesting. So we have to say this is a big number. 5% was unrecognized bacteria at the time of harvesting. So a lot of people, we rush it, and basically those are 5%, they might kill the, uh, the recipient. Transplant ID physician willingness to accept patient with active bacterial infection vary. So some uh, physicians, they say, no, I'm not gonna take him, it's not clear. Some physician, okay, let's give him an antibiotic and do it. Again, because of their, uh, the need. So uh, the rate of accepting organ from donor uh, with active infection, you see here uh, for positive blood culture and respiratory culture, if enterobacteria is 72, respiratory 42, ESPL or CRE carbapenem resistant is basically lower when you have it. And Pseudomonas, sometimes we accept it, sorry. Uh, MSSA, MRSA, it's lower you're accepting. But when you have streptococcus it's, uh, and DRE, this is the lowest because you can still treat it, but you have to prepare the patient. Uh, in our hospital king case, this is courtesy from Dr. Nizami. What we found from the lung transplant donor, uh, when we culture and we get, collect the data for uh, us a few years, so acetonobacter and Klebsiella are the highest, but we're seeing every type of infection from the transplanted donor. So is there a defined high-risk bacterial infection? Meningitis, yes, but it's not clear. We can uh, treat it. If the bacteria, can we refuse the organ, transplanted organ uh, infection, colonization versus infection, and the pathogen, just uh, we have to look into the pathogen. Really, all this question 
we still we don't know and they depend on the need for the organ and the risk benefit of each patient. So if we have coagulated ne negative tablet focus, usually no transmission and they get to uh, respond quickly to the treatment. If there is staph oris or if they're focused or kind of negative, bacteremia or intra-abdominal infection in the recipient is very common. So those are need to be treated very well. And the liver transplant associated with graft loss, thrombosis, mortality, delay in initiating of target therapy more than 24 hours. You have to remember that those patients, the minute they get the transplanted, they are on medication that can lower their immune system. And even with antibiotic, might not be able to support them. And that's why they are really vulnerable uh, for infection, especially if they're gram negative. So more than nine published reports on cluster of MDR gram negative donor infection colonization. And basically you have to start looking into genotype and phenotypic to be able to determine the patient are uh, really colonized versus they are, have active infection and transplanted organ versus non-transplanted organ. And uh, basically the percent, the reason you have high mortality rate can reach up to 41% uh, in the recipient. And plus we're gonna uh, lose uh, more than 60% and, and uh, increase mortality. So uh, what we should be done? When you receive those patients, please, uh, you have to isolate them. Unfortunately, most of the patients we receive at King South Hospital, they already colonized with many organisms before, because from the time they come to the hospital or Pearl Hospital until they got to us, maybe around two weeks is the long period before they declare deaths and the family they know and we contact the family. So it's taking a long time. And those patients, they already have so many organisms that we are losing the organ. So we have to do a contact precaution to all those patients with full gown, full mask, full gloves. We have to isolate them and do surveillance strategy with frequent culture. We have to do hand hygiene. We have to basically uh, de-escalate antibiotic. Don't give really uh, antibiotic that is not needed. If you start big the gun with uh, uh, broad spectrum antibiotic, try to cut down to decrease your resistance in your hospital and also environment, environmental cleaning is very important. So, uh, so how we, uh, should we evaluate potential donor for infection? So always think what the reason the patient died. Is this trauma? We know this is covered. If they always you have to have low threshold to suspect CNS infection, in patient with no clear risk factor for vascular event. Just recently, I have a patient came in, it's not an infection here. We could not figure out why, it's a young guy. But basically after one week of decreased level of consciousness, we discovered that the patient have West Nile virus. So whenever you don't know, uh, consider it an infection until proven otherwise. Get as much information about the donor as you can from family, from friend, uh, what is tra recent travel, what kind of hobby, what kind of job he does, uh, does he have any risk of behavior, smoking, uh, uh, alcohol, always be uh, suspicious. It, uh, does he have with, work in, with animal? Does he have animal at home? And does he have any TB exposure or incarcerated or alcohol history? So infection control bundle, each hospital, they have to have infection and you have to look into it uh, in very uh, small detail. Uh, in the report of, to Scott, give them detail of presentation and imaging report, detail fever, culture, a date, when, uh, what type of culture, what the result. If you get the result, do not leave it, even if we took the body from you, Please make sure to follow up those patients for any culture and contact Scott or contact any referring hospital they recruit over because early we discover the bacteria we can treat the recipient and also what kind of antibiotic he received earlier and later on. With this, I will uh, finally uh, finish my lecture and I'm more than happy to take any questions.
Kirito, thank you very much, Dr. Riaz. Uh, excellent review. So there is here one question. They say the meningitis patient with renal transplant, how old was the, the doctor? I'm not really sure about this question. So, so uh, at the end, as I mentioned, please, uh, for any patient, uh, there is one question uh, for donor with positive blood culture for candida albicans. Do we accept him as an organ donor after treatment or accept him depend on the organ to be transplanted? Uh, patient with candida albicans, you can start treatment usually around for seven to 14 days. You have to document uh, first, uh, sometimes, uh, it's controversial about doing an echo to make sure no vegetation. Also, uh, blood culture to be negative uh, uh, before we stop antifungal. So the guideline is very clear. And usually those are can be cleared totally from the bloodstream. And yes, they can still organ donor if it's, uh, if it's clean. Okay. So we have to postpone the donation process at least one week, right? Correct, correct. You have a, a, one week after clearing uh, blood, blood, blood culture. two blood culture were negative, then you can clear them. Sure. Usually we get 14, up to 14 days of uh, treatment. And so this is something we see uh, often. Okay, I think uh, giving you no further question, uh, I'd like to let me see. Here, there is any prevention, uh, preventive antibiotic if donor is febrile, but organism not identified. Uh, it's not basically it depend on uh, try to find the source. By doing pan culture, you can start empiric treatment uh, with a broad spectrum antibiotic, and later you can start de-escalating based on the culture. Uh, and uh, it depends on the background of your hospital, because if you have high rate of infection in your hospital of uh, MDR or MRSA, then you have to cover for this event. Number two, basically how many days a patient has been in your hospital when he start having uh, uh, I mean febrile. Is this after a few days is a hospital acquired infection or he came from the community? If, and again, as I mentioned in my lecture, if the patient came in with change of mental status and you have a fever and you don't have a diagnosis of the brain death, you have to consider this as meningitis, encephalitis, or meningitis and treat it as so, okay? And when we talk about culture, you have to be aggressive. Bronchoscopy, if you're available in your hospital, blood culture, urine culture, look into intra-abdominal source, uh, the hidden infection may be acalculus cholestitis or ascending cholangitis, meningitis. So really, you have to, we have to do our homework because first, remember, we, we don't want to lose the organ. Each patient and we can uh, die, we can benefit from up to seven to eight uh, recipient. And at the same time, uh, we are losing organ for no reason. Let me see if any further question. Okay, can a recovered COVID positive be a donor? An excellent question, and I expect this uh, question. Uh, still, there is a really big controversial. Uh, so let me kind of summarize about COVID. Now, currently, the guideline is still evolving. So if I'm going to tell you something, it's still based on case report. Now, there's one case of patient here, uh, uh, they only recruit, they took him after recovering from COVID, kidney and liver, but the mRNA for COVID was positive uh, in those organs and they transplanted. So the data is not out, but now the recommendation, patient, any donor supposed to get a nasal swab and also some authority, they said they need bronchoscopy to get two samples from the lung and from the nose. 
Second, if somebody is already recovered from COVID, uh, some they are checking the antibody, and if uh, uh, the CRP, uh, the CRP uh, for the COVID is negative, after, when sometimes they're waiting up to 21 days after the infection and uh, the end of the symptoms, and yes, he can be an organ transplant if he's not immune compromised, because immunocompromised patient, they can uh, hide the infection or the virus for a long period of time. So those are for can the COVID they're giving. Now, second question, are the people who's recovered from COVID can be an organ, uh, we can uh, transplant them? Yes, we can do this. We are referring those patients uh, because we have a huge number of pulmonary fibrosis uh, from COVID pneumonitis, they require lungs and we are referred. But unfortunately, because the limited number of pulmonary uh, of lungs, we are not able to help all those people this time. So there is a big load for all transplant organ center for lung transplantation. I think uh, I covered all this uh, part. Okay, given the time, uh, I'd like uh, Dr. Uh, Bishir, if you'd like to give the uh, final word uh, for this uh, meeting. Yes. Uh, with this, I would like, on behalf of all my colleagues from the Saudi Center for Organ Transplantation, I'm really grateful, great appreciation to our speaker, to make this uh, course very successful over these two days. And great thanks to all the attendees and hope that you enjoy this uh, course and you find it useful uh, for your daily practice. And just, I would like to remind all our colleagues that if you have any issue related to the notification, diagnosis or management, don't hesitate to contact us. We have a toll-free number, 800-124-5500. And also we have mobile on-call on number. It's available 24-7. It's 054-700-7641. Don't hesitate to contact all our medical coordinators. They are available to help you, to guide you, to share with you any concern. And really, what we need is to spread the positive attitude about the organ donation at your hospital, between your colleague, especially that uh, to promote the positive attitude by using this initiative by the King Salman and his deputy, Prince Mohammed, that they are a donor and they put this one available, make it on, on Tawakkalna. This is just to create the positive attitude about organ donation. So thank you very much. This number, uh, sorry to interrupt you, this number is available online if they went and Google it. Can they find this number uh, quickly online, all this data that okay. is, on, this is on Google, if you write Scott or Saudi Center, you will find, you will find this uh, 800 or even the uh, online and the emails of all our uh, doctors or coordinators. Okay, because one of the question, what's Scott? Scott is Saudi Center for Organ Transplant. If you put it on Google, you have the webpage, all this number are available for you. And as Dr. Fisher, please feel free to contact Scott. They can either help you, they can uh, guide you to where, they can send you all the brochure, they have all the guidelines, about how to manage the patient A to Z. So we have you even, uh, I think Dr. Bisher is working with his team about how to approach the family uh, and discuss with them. So they are very helpful. I've been working with them, please. So if you have this, uh, sorry, and I'm interrupting, but I like to really emphasize, do not hesitate to contact Scott. They are very helpful. They can really guide you what to do. Uh, don't lose the uh, organ. You are saving life. We need to save life. We are, there's many patients need for the organ. 
and take things seriously. And a lot of people that are worried about the ethical issue. So let us help you in this uh, part. There is enough uh, fatwa uh, from all religion. And as you mentioned, uh, the crown prince and also our king, both are organ donors. So we have full support from everybody to help our patient. And when an Ahya, thank you but we need it guys we need your help with this I would like also to thank Dr. Ahmed Riaz Jamil without his uh, efforts and all this uh, collaboration his input the course will not be a, uh, successful thank you very much Dr. Riaz he is the consultant pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine from King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Riyadh, and with his great experience dealing with the deceased donor. Thank you, everyone. And I hope to keep in touch. I will repeat, as mentioned by my colleague, don't hesitate to contact us. And uh, the 12 CME hour, you will get it in case you attend more than 60 or 70 percent from the two days course. Looking forward to have a similar courses, but I hope we will meet in person, either in the headquarters at the Saudi Center, or we're gonna have a promotional educational program in this coming 21, 22 years by visiting the all region in Saudi Arabia. So hopefully to see you soon, and thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.